According to the CDC, childhood obesity has more than doubled in children and quadrupled in adolescents in the past 30 years. Now nearly one in three adolescent children are classified as either overweight or obese. The consequences of this problem can be dramatic and lifelong, including risks for diabetes, liver and heart disease, bone and joint issues, difficulty sleeping, and a multitude of psychological challenges. Hello, my name is Dr. Jay Greenspan. On this edition of Pediatric Chat, we'll discuss the rising tide of childhood obesity and weight management. We will talk about what abnormal weight is, what it does to our children and their future, and what we can and must do about it. Joining me today, as always, is my co-host, Dr. Paul Rosen. Hello, Paul. Hello, Jay. And also joining us is our special guest, Dr. Sandy Hassink, who is a pediatrician and weight management specialist at Nemours and the president-elect of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Jay. Hi, Paul. So, Sandy, parents are often uh, aware that we have an obesity epidemic. What is that all about, and is it really an epidemic? Well, Jay, absolutely, it's an epidemic, and I started taking care of children with obesity about 26 years ago, and I've seen this epidemic come to fruition, unfortunately. Parents are aware of the epidemic. What's often hard for parents to sort of see is this epidemic affecting them and their families personally. I would say that the rise in this epidemic has been fairly complicated. There are many factors that are involved with seeing our children get heavier and heavier. We certainly know that dietary factors play an enormous role in this. And so if you look at the rise of consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages, fast food, convenience foods, snacking, all are factors in the rise of childhood obesity, as well as what we are seeing is the rise in screen time and the enormous amount of time children spend watching TV and the various screens that they use for recreational activities. Mm -hmm as well as sedentary time, which is just the absence or the decrease of physical activity in many children's lives. So there's lots of factors playing into this, in addition to the hereditary predisposition that many families have for obesity and some newer factors like the microbiome, the bacteria that live in our intestines, some people feel are associated with obesity. So there are many, many factors in this epidemic. Just the nuts and bolts of this, how do we know when our child is overweight? You go back to what I originally said about parents maybe not appreciating where their child stands in terms of their weight. So this is where you really want to go back to your pediatrician and get that height and weight. Every year on every well check, children have their heights and weights measured and should have something called a body mass index plotted on a graph, which shows is the child healthy weight, overweight, or has obesity based on their age and gender. Parents should look for this graph and ask their pediatrician about it. If you're unsure about whether you know your child's BMI or you've seen that graph, the next time you check in with your doc, even if it's for another complaint or a sore throat, you can always ask to see that growth chart and have that discussion. Yeah, so get the parents and you Mm -hmm. should be involved quickly in this early on. And is there a difference between overweight and obese, or is it just terminology? It's actually based on growth percentiles, which are uh, patterns of growth in children. So when a child exceeds the 85th percentile for BMI, and is between the 85th and the 95th percentile, that's overweight. And that's just a marker for, let's ask some more questions. And we always look at that one point. We look at how the child's grown before that time. And then we ask about eating and activity and sedentary behavior. If a child has obesity, that means that the body mass index is over the 95th percentile for age and gender. That is a marker for more health problems, and we are very concerned at that point that we start asking questions about lifestyle so we can prevent further weight accumulation, but we also are now asking questions about health problems. Sandy, we know in adults, obesity contributes to type 2 diabetes. Is it the same thing for children? Yes, and Paul, that's such a good question because when I started in this field, we really didn't know that. We didn't actually think children were going to get type 2 diabetes. In fact, at that point, it was called adult diabetes. Uh, What we found out is that children are not immune from the side effects of obesity. So they will get type 2 diabetes, liver disease associated with obesity, lipid problems associated with obesity, and high blood pressure, just like adults. And this is not just our adolescents. This is coming down now into our younger children. I know that when I was going through training, traditional teaching was not to check kids for their triglycerides or their cholesterol. What's changed? 
Well, that has really changed. And in 2007, we had an expert committee, 14 medical organizations got together to grapple with this problem of how are we now going to look at these children, our own children with obesity, and how would we screen? And so the recommendations there are every child who is overweight or has obesity needs a screen for blood sugar, lipids, and liver enzymes, Mm. at least an initial one, and then based on those results yearly or more often. And so one of the problems, I think, is the pressure to eat unhealthy, right? So fast foods and junk food and sugared beverages and stuff. How big of an impact is that? And what can parents do to get away from that? We do have a problem. And we have a problem that our children are being marketed to. And if anyone of you who are parents out there has looked at daytime children's TV, especially Saturday mornings, there are lots of food advertisements And the majority of those are for unhealthy food, sugared beverages, sugared cereals, fast foods. We actually know by studies we've done that those advertisements are directly associated with a child's obesity. So what parents really can do is switch to non-commercial TV whenever possible so that you eliminate the commercials. Sometimes we do funny things, like we say to the families, you know, when a commercial comes on, go in the other room and do some jumping jacks or do (laughs) something else and come back in. We really try to spare them the intense marketing that they're subjected to. And parents need to be aware of this because it's not by accident. When you go in the grocery store and your child starts asking you for that particular brand of food, it's not by accident. Mm. And you can trace that back to the advertising. So parents have to be pretty savvy about what's going on. So a little bit of tough love because there's important consequences down Mm -hmm. the line. Yeah. So Sandy, in the past, we've had the food triangle as from the government recommending what types of foods and what amounts. Can you speak to how that's been updated and what the best recommendations are now? Well, now we have a plate instead of a triangle. So that's an improvement (laughs) because that's more like we eat. So where we're really focused on is fruit and vegetable consumption. We know absolutely that most adults and most children are not getting enough fruits and vegetables in their diet. At minimum, children should be getting five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. We're also focused on dairy products, but low-fat dairy, so that we maximize the value of dairy products, but we minimize the fat. And the same with our protein sources. We're looking at lower fat proteins than we had before. So we want a well-balanced diet. We want all food groups included, but we really want to focus on fresh and healthy foods and multi-grain products as well. And does that include natural or organic, or is that not as big a deal as... Well, you know, in our search, and we all as parents search for this, we're searching for healthy things for our families to eat. The advantage of organic foods is they're not grown with pesticides. Unfortunately, we don't have enough research to actually know what difference that makes in children. But I will tell you that in my recommendations for families and children, we're trying for the healthiest food possible and to start wherever you are. So if you have um, a diet that has a lot of fast food in it, going to healthier foods is your first step. If you're already at the very healthy diet and you'd like to try some organic products and you can afford them, that would be okay. But again, we don't have real evidence about the effects or the benefits of organic products. They don't make any difference for weight loss or weight control. It's mostly about the pesticide exposures Mm -hmm. that we're worried about. Everyone probably knows that sugared sodas are not good for you or sugar pop, depending on what part of the country you're from. What about juices and diet sodas? Well, I hope everybody knows that sugared (laughs) beverages are not good for them. And if they don't, I'm here to say that is correct. We really try to make low-fat milk and water the beverages of choice for children. We know uh, juice is important, but the American Academy would say when you're a little child, four to six ounces, the uh, older school age and adolescent, eight to 12 ounces of juice is plenty. We like you to eat your fruit so you get the benefit of all the fiber and the other nutrients in in the fruit. The problem with drinking sweetened drinks and even juice is you can drink a lot of calories before Mm. you actually ever feel full. So you don't get that full feeling from all those calories. And uh, there are good options like water or low-fat milk. So we really are trying to encourage people to eat their fruit instead of drink their fruit and then to use water and milk as their beverage choices. Sandy, in my house at dinner, we have to remind the kids to put away the iPad and text your friend later and, you know, it's time to focus on dinner. Are you finding dinner time, a lot of kids are distracted with screens, they're not paying attention to what they're eating or the amounts they're eating? 
Well, dinner time is actually a very important time for families. So just to back up a step and say that family meals are recommended for obesity prevention. And family meals really do mean family meals where you're able to look at each other and not at your screens. So not only are the children looking at screens, but the adults are looking at screens. So many families have a no screen rule at dinner, and that includes the television. Distracted eating is the opposite of mindful eating. When you're aware of what you're eating and you're enjoying your food, you're eating enough, but not too much. When you're distracted and you're looking at a screen, you are eating more than you actually need because you're not paying attention to when you're full. I think the no screen rule is a great rule at dinner. I've heard that term before, mindful eating. Mm -hmm. Could you give a little more detail? Is there training kids need in that? Uh, The first principle of mindful eating is what we just talked about. It's setting the stage so that you are not distracted when you're eating. It's also, believe it or not, sitting down at the table and not trying to have a meal standing up or running around. And many families are in that position. It's paying attention to the texture of the food, the taste of the food, commenting. The parents can comment on how the food tastes to them. Really, it's paying attention. I don't think any special training is needed unless you have a child who really is struggling with these concepts. But the parents can set a stage for the enjoyment of food, non-distracted eating, and good role modeling for the parents, I think are key things parents can really do right now. So chewing slowly and sort of Mm -hmm. savoring Mm -hmm. the moment with Mm -hmm. your family sounds pretty cool to me. Yeah, and I don't think you have to count the times you chew or anything, (laughs) but I do think just enjoyment of what's actually happening and that the fact that you are eating... I will add to that, that involving children in food preparation and in cooking is a very powerful Mm. way to get them involved in healthy eating. The young children love to help. The older children like to be involved in menu planning and reading a recipe and even shopping. So the more you can include the children in that and in those healthy food preparation activities, the more likely they are going to be to enjoy that meal and to explore new tastes. Sandy, we talked a little bit about exercise, and with everyone's busy schedule, sometimes it's hard to make sure everyone in the family is getting enough exercise. Are there any strategies you coach families about? Well, again, we start where the families are. One of the things we talk about a lot are the activities of daily living. So if at minimum, if you're going to the mall, park far away and walk, walk a lap of the mall before you go. If you can walk to or from school safely, do that. Sometimes we have the kids take their walk right when they come home from school before they get indoors and kind of stuck down in their seats, and the parents can go walk with them. Children tell me all the time, they will go outside if there are other children outside. The problem is often if you look out your window, there's no children outside. So even organizing a group of friends and encouraging some outdoor play can be a good first step in building activity levels in children. Certainly structured activities are often helpful if they're affordable and you can get to them. Play groups for the little kids, some early sports involvement for the older kids, some community resources like the Y or the Boys and Girls Club can be helpful. So I think the families just have to give this some thought. It's not like the old days where we just sort of assumed all children will be active. And I don't think my mother ever thought about how much activity I got. I was outdoors a lot. Childhood is no longer a normally active phase. As parents, we now have to actually think about how much activity we're getting and are we being good role models for our children as well in being active ourselves. So there's exercise and there's diet, and both components are extremely important for our weight as kids Mm -hmm. as well as adults. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a package deal. You want to have a well-balanced diet. You want to have activity. And the other thing you want to have is good sleep. That's a newer wrinkle in the story of weight gain as we found that children who get too little sleep often gain more weight. So really having good routines, having meals that occur pretty much on time, having planned snacks, not grazing, having a time for physical activity. And oftentimes parents need to reschedule their after school time. There's a lot of concern that the children will not get their homework done. But what happens is if the child comes home after all day at school and sits down at their homework, oftentimes they're a little fidgety, they have a hard time concentrating, and they're using up daylight where they could be outside. So we tell parents to have the child come home, give them their little after-school healthy snack, and then have them go outside. That does a couple things. One, it gets them physically active. Two, it sort of breaks that sedentary pattern they may have had for school, refreshes them, have them come in for dinner, then do the homework, 
then watch the TV. Mm -hmm. So you can see in this pattern, the television or the screen time comes at the end of the day when you've already achieved your healthy snacks and meals and your physical activity time and done your homework and not right after school where you're then prying the child from the TV set to try to get them to do the other things. So Sandy, there's been a lot of great learning so far and we've stimulated some questions from the audience. I have a few callers on the line. First caller is Julie. You have a question for Sandy? Yes, I do. Thanks for taking my call. My husband and I are both a little chunky and we've struggled with diets all of our lives. My eight-year-old daughter seems to be following in our footsteps as far as being a little heavy. We all eat very healthy meals and don't snack very much, uh, not much fast food, and she's pretty active. Uh, It seems to be genetic. Uh, Does her weight at eight predict where she'll be as an adult? Well, Julie, thanks very much for that question, and I think you're right on target. At this point, I think all parents need to be concerned about the obesity epidemic we're having in children, especially parents who know that they have obesity in their families, because a lot of the predisposition to obesity does run in families. Sounds like you're doing a lot of really good things with a healthy diet and activity. One of the things that we find really helpful is when you're in this kind of situation and you can't quite figure out what to do next, to start keeping records of what you, your whole family, and your child are eating just to start tracking any variations. It's hard to remember on Friday what we've eaten on Monday or Tuesday. It's easy to get off track, and sometimes this can bring out areas that you haven't realized that were potential areas for improvement, like snacks at school or snacks at sporting events or when there's social events. So this can start you off in just taking an environmental scan. The other thing you can do is just take a look at your kitchen and look in your cabinets. Sometimes food sneaks in that we're not even aware of. And having those trigger foods available even for occasional snacks can drive children to search out the foods and to consume them more frequently than you might want. Activity is a real issue for lots of our kids, and I think daily activity is what we're really shooting for here. And remember that although the recommendations say an hour of physical activity, you can break that up into even 10-minute chunks. And so just, again, keeping in mind how much activity your daughter's getting on a day-to-day basis would be important. And don't forget the TV. We knew for a long time that TV was associated with weight gain. But what we've known more recently, it's really the TV commercials, the marketing to children that drive eating. And your daughter at eight is right in that point where they're not quite differentiating between what's marketing and what's reality. Mm -hmm. So just keep an eye on the TV watching. It should be less than two hours a day. And if you do watch TV and could watch non-commercial TV, that would be really great. Great. Thank you. That's good information. So do you think, um, to, to Julie's question on her daughter, how worried should she be? Does weight sometimes come off, or is it something she really has to attack now at eight? Well, at eight, I'd be really checking in with your pediatrician, because what you really want to do at this point is to look at that growth chart and look at the body mass index, which is the height and weight that we use, that calculation we use to see if your daughter would be in the overweight category or in the category that we call obese as physicians, but is a body mass index over the 95th percentile for age and gender. If that's so, At eight, we'd be looking to just keep her weight the same for a while Mm. and let her height catch up to her weight. And you can have a lot of help tracking that with your pediatrician. Mm. Great. We have an appointment next month. I'll follow up on it. That would be great. And don't forget to make sure you ask to go over that growth chart so you can see it and track it for yourself. Hey, thanks thanks for calling in, Julie. And take care. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Sandy, you mentioned with our last caller that there should be an hour of exercise. Mm -hmm. Is there any more recommendation, what kind of exercise? Well, I think it's really important to encourage outdoor exercise at this particular age because this is when gross motor development is still taking place and outdoor exercise is the best predictor of overall exercise. But that's challenging for lots of families. One thing we ask our families to do, just like you checked in with your kitchen, check in with what's around your house in terms of park and safe places to play, and they can be put into your day-to-day planning. The other thing parents often like to do is see what's the opportunity, if any, to walk to and from school or to play after school at the playground while they're waiting to go home. So there's some options parents can check into right in their home or right in their neighborhood. So if the recommendation is an hour, it's Mm -hmm. not necessarily an hour of aerobic heavy-duty exercise. It could be walking or just being active. 
You know, at this point, we're looking to start where the children are at any exercise. And usually what happens is, is they get used to having that exercise and playing. They want to do more and more. And then you can look for what they're interested in and step it up. But it's always important to start where your child is. If they haven't been doing anything, then walking is terrific. Why don't we take another call? I think we have Linda on the line. Linda, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. 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 Uh, My question is, I'm pregnant with my first child, and I'm going to deliver in the summer. I really want to get off on the right foot, and I've been told that breastfeeding babies are often fat babies, and I have concerns about that. Is breastfeeding the best way to go if you're worried about weight? So first of all, Linda, congratulations. What an exciting time for, for you and your family. And you are absolutely on the right track thinking about breastfeeding while you're pregnant. Breastfeeding actually is the best way to go for children. There is a preventive effect toward obesity, a protective effect. And for so many reasons, breastfeeding is the best food for our infants, all the way up to 12 months, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations. Breastfeeding babies can look a little chunky, but we know that breastfeeding is the gold standard of how we feed our babies. So as long as you're breastfeeding, and especially if you're exclusively breastfeeding, I wouldn't worry at all about that weight. They look just fine as they come off that breastfed trajectory. I think that in addition to thinking about breastfeeding, I think that this is a wonderful time to take stock of how you and your family are eating and what your own eating patterns are. Because as your baby gets weaned and transitions from breast milk to food, they're going to eat exactly like you do. And they're going to be eating those foods and you're going to be the models for how your child eats. So it's a great time right now, and I know you're trying to be healthy during pregnancy, to look at what's in the house, to look at your eating patterns, and to really focus on getting as healthy as possible for that new little one to come into your life. So Linda, yeah, Linda, breast is best, as we say in the pediatric circles, and um, really good luck with breastfeeding. I know that some challenges in the first days, just hang in there, and if you need help with that, there are professionals, but we really encourage you to give it a shot. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Linda. And I guess, Sandy, you know, it brings up a good point that breastfeeding babies often seem to be a little bit chunky, but we know it's protective. What do you think about the chunky baby story? Do you see that sort of viewed as a sign of really good health? There must be limits to that. Well, the first thing that we do as pediatricians when we see that quote-unquote chunky baby is you plot the baby on the growth chart just like you would an older child, and you find out where they are. And then you start asking questions because the most important thing you can do is find out how and when and how much is that baby actually getting fed. For a breastfed baby who's exclusively breastfed, we now have special growth charts that have Mm. been developed just for breastfeeding babies that are used as the gold standard. So when feeding is exclusively breastfed, that is not a problem. However, when you see feeding that parents are feeding a baby every time they cry, you're not really understanding when the baby is full. You will want to ask how they're mixing their formula, mm-hmm. if they're mixing formula correctly, if they're transitioning the baby to cereal in the bottle or other kinds of food too early before six months. These are all questions that pediatricians really do focus on, and families can also think about. Families get lots of advice about how to feed their babies, and the best thing to do is check with your pediatrician when you're getting advice from friends and family members to make sure that you're on target. Yeah. So it's that big, chunky baby we used to think was always healthy, and now we're learning maybe not so much. No, about 11% of our babies under one year of age are actually over the 95th percentile Mm. for weight for height, which is a marker for us to begin asking all those questions. So it's not panic time, but it's time to start asking questions about feeding and sleeping and routines and uh, how things are going with the crying and responding to crying with feeding or knowing how to soothe that baby. Sandy, it seems that sometimes parents are using the diet to modify certain symptoms. So for example, some kids I see in the office who have fatigue or other symptoms, families are starting to alter the diet. Maybe they're trying a gluten-free diet or other restrictive diets. Do you have any comment on that? Well, I think families, adults tend to do for children what they do for themselves. And you pretty much well know that adults use diet. uh, What I thought you were also going to say is to get more energy. We're often using, you know, snacks or high calorie things to get more energy. Uh, If we don't feel good, we'll alter our diet. But unless you have a diagnosis of a real dietary or gastrointestinal problem, really we're aiming at healthy, well-rounded, balanced diets. And 
the tired child or the child that's picky eating. There are other things to think about. Why are they tired? Again, sleep is a real problem for most of our children. If they're picky, I think you can shine the mirror back on yourself and say, what am I eating in the family and how am I role modeling this? And can I just gently involve my child in preparing some of the foods that they don't like? So I think unless you have a real diagnosis, I think you want to aim straight at the well-balanced diet with all the food groups included. And remember, I want to say something here I think that's very important for parents. Parents' job is to really present to that child a healthy diet in appropriate portions. At any given meal or snack, the child will eat what they are hungry for. So it's not your job to pressure the child to eat more or less. It's just to present the right food in the right amounts. And then the child at that time of eating will decide what they actually want to eat. But remember then, you've given them healthy choices and you've given them correct portions that are not too much for them. So that can take some of the struggle out of the mealtime. Sandy, at Nemours, we see families from all different kinds of cultural backgrounds and ethnicities. And do you find food is tied into how the kids are eating, the cultural differences? Yes, oftentimes. And there isn't a culture that exists where food is not critically important for all kinds of reasons, for celebrating special occasions, certain kinds of food. And again, it's important for all of us to remember to start where the families are. So it may be that you can modify some recipes for the cultural foods that they like to make them a little less energy dense or high calorie. You can always work with all parents about portion sizes because I think we've supersized everything in this country. And if you look at portion sizes across the obesity epidemic, they've tripled or quadrupled. So the same foods might be fine, but the portions are excessive. So I think the issue of cultural foods is you respect the cultural food. If they need to be modified, you can. You can always talk about portion sizes because that's a problem throughout all childhood with all parents is that we've supersized ourselves. Is there a general rule about when you should stop eating before you go to bed? Not a general rule, I would say, but I think that a common sense here should prevail. So children who are skipping breakfast in the morning and maybe eating a light lunch and then start eating right after school and then are eating throughout that later part of the day are really setting themselves up for a little bit of a disordered eating pattern and eating a little more food in the later part of the day because they were hungrier in the beginning. So I think three meals and a snack after school are appropriate for a school-age child. For a little child, three meals and two snacks. Dinner uh, should be when it's convenient for the family. Some families need to eat a little later because of the family's work schedule. I don't worry as much about that as just having that regular three meal and one snack pattern with the healthy food. What happens late at night, though, is the tireder people get, the more likely they are to turn to snack foods and the junk foods, and then that becomes a problem if that's the kind of food you're eating late into the night. And teenagers are especially prone to this. You started the weight management program Mm -hmm. here, one of the first Mm -hmm. in the country, if not the first. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we have a fellowship, and this has really become important for all of the pediatricians. Mm -hmm. But you were sort of limited, as I recall, to the most extreme because there's such a big problem in this country and in this state. So could you just spend a few minutes on the really pathologic cases and what advice you can give parents to not get there and anything we could offer once you get down the line of uh, morbid obesity? All of us in pediatrics are very concerned about our children who have obesity and have what we would call the comorbidities of obesity, so the diseases that come along with obesity. As pediatricians, we feel that prevention is crucial for all our children. And just to spend a minute on prevention, we're talking about measuring height and weight and body mass index, but we're also talking about high-risk eating and activity behaviors, behaviors that will get you into trouble. So as all pediatricians and parents need to be concerned that those high-risk behaviors don't get entrained into the child and the family's patterns. But once a child has obesity and has some of these complications, we do offer here what we call a comprehensive weight management program. So we have pediatricians specially trained in weight management, we have dietitians, we have psychology, we have nurse practitioners, we have exercise specialists, we even have social workers. Because these children suffer and they suffer from medical problems. So we often use all of our subspecialists here at AI at one time or another see our kids either for their liver disease or for their diabetes or for their orthopedic problems. They also have tremendous problems with being bullied and teased, Mm. which is its own epidemic in the world of obesity. 
So we have an intense program where children come back frequently to see us with their families, where we really do manage what we call comorbidities, the diseases that come from weight, as well as the weight. At the very extreme, we do offer bariatric surgery or weight surgery here at the hospital. That's a very special program. We thought a lot about doing this. The children have to stay with us in our program six months before we even do the surgery so that we can properly evaluate, is this the right option for a child and parent who want this option? So we do try to meet the needs of all the children across the whole spectrum of weight here at the hospital. That's very important information, and I know you'd like to get down to lower BMIs Mm -hmm. if we can just sort of solve this problem. You are the president-elect for the American Academy of Pediatrics. What's our stance on weight for the country? Is that part of your platform? Thanks for asking that question. The obesity has been on the strategic plan of the American Academy of Pediatrics for the last 14 years. We wrote the first resolution in the year 2000 to make this an issue for the Academy. We have focused on providing physicians and families tools to improve their eating and activity. Our current activities really revolve around our Institute for a Healthy Childhood Weight, which we inaugurated a year and a half ago, which further focuses the activities of the Academy of Pediatrics to not only give physicians and families tools to help with the weight, but to partner with national organizations about their efforts toward a healthy weight. Now, this means right now we're very focused on children with obesity But remember that it's called healthy weight. We really have a critical focus in access to healthy nutrition for all Mm. our children. And we will eventually be converging our work with the hunger and food insecurity communities. So healthy nutrition is really a foundation of child health. And I think we really have to all be focused on ensuring that for all the kids. Yeah, and I know that uh, the First Lady is involved with this and uh, Pro Football is involved with this Mm -hmm. and the the American Academy is likely partnering with these great agencies and Mm -hmm. people. Yeah. It's great news. There's a lot of learning. We've had other chats, by the way, on bullying where weight has been mentioned and we just had a chat on sleep. Mm -hmm. And what we learned from sleep is what I'm learning from you today on weight, which is this is something that parents have to think about from the very beginning and that early patterns are important for later life and health, and that sleep goes along with weight, which goes along with lots of psychological issues. Any take-home messages other than, you know, parents have to really think ahead about all this when they really become pregnant? I think all of that is true, and I think this can be done. Parents just need to dial this in. You have partners. You have your pediatrician as a good partner. Many community organizations now are very focused on this. They are becoming community partners. Schools are getting healthier. So you are not alone. Many parents are facing this. The CDC calls this one of their winnable battles. Mm. This is doable. And it's doable because if every family focuses on this for their child and the community begins to focus on it, we will win this battle. It got ahead of us, but I think it's a winnable battle. So I, I am actually encouraged that we can take care of this. Well, thanks so much, Sandy. Of course, if there are questions, you can reach Paul and myself on this website, and we will get back to you, Sandy, with those questions to get some answers, because we could go on forever. That's right, Jay. Thank you so much, Sandy, for being here. Thanks, Jay and Paul. To our listeners, if you have a question about this topic, or if there's another topic you'd like us to explore in a future pediatric chat, you can send it to us by using the question portal on our webpage. And be sure to view our library for more pediatric chat programs. I'm Dr. Jay Greenspan, and thanks for listening.